The Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, says it has little role to play in the conduct of direct primaries of political parties. And stakeholders bicker as Lagos for Lagos joins the People's Democratic Party, PDP, over irreconcilable differences. Well, this is Plus Politics. I am Mary Anacol. The Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, says it has very little role to play in the conduct of direct primaries and by political parties. Professor Yakubu Mahmoud, INEC chairman, disclosed this when he met with members of the House of Representatives Committee on Appropriation in Abuja. The meeting following a resolution of the House mandating the committee to interface with INEC on the cost implication of direct primaries by political parties as contained in the 2021 Electoral Act Amendment Bill, uh, Representative Mokhtar Bakhtera for ABC Borneo stated that Mahmoud told lawmakers that the conduct and funding of primaries were basically the function of political parties and not the umpire. Well, joining us to discuss this is Gideo Logon, he's a legal practitioner, and Biodu Shomi, a political analyst. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining us. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to join you. All right. Okay, great, great, great. Uh, before we start this conversation, last week I spoke with a, a commissioner uh, in INEC um, in charge of voter education, um, Mr. Festus Okoye, and I did ask a question about this direct primaries issue and INEC's position on it, the cost implication and the bickering over it. Let's take a look at what the INEC commissioner said and then we will start this conversation. You see, the commission really does not want to get involved in the debate on the issue of uh, direct or indirect primaries. Uh, the truth of the matter is that within the existing legal framework, the Electoral Act 2010 as amended that is in existence as of today, the law provides that political parties may adopt direct or indirect prim uh, direct primaries or indirect primaries. We have monitored the direct primaries by some political parties. And so the issue of direct primaries is not new to our electoral uh, legal, legal, legal framework. Yes, there is no doubt whatsoever that if all the political parties adopt direct primaries, it will invo involve costs, um, and that the indirect primaries involves less costs. But that is neither here nor there. What is fundamental is that Section 4 of the Constitution of, the, of Nigeria gives the National Assembly the power to make laws uh, for, for this country. Secondly, if you also look at Section 228 of the Constitution, it also gives the National Assembly the power to make laws relating to the internal democracy within political parties, including their, prim their primaries. So as far as the Commission is concerned, if, in their wisdom, the National Assembly makes provision for only indirect prim uh, for direct primaries and the president assents to it, we will find ways and means of implementing the intent of the law uh, because that is what we are uh, obligated to do. So I'm going to start with you, um, Basta Logo. Mr. Koye was saying, obviously, diplomatically, that he does not want to, to want to get into that conversation or the debate about direct primaries and the funding. Um, but looking at the existing laws and, of course, the Electoral Act um, and what the National Assembly is proposing now, how feasible is this, especially when, with the tag of billions um, for conducting these elections? Apparently, it's, a, it's the responsibility of the parties to fund their primaries. When we talk about primaries, we talk about the, the first aspect of presenting candidates to go and represent the parties at the general elections. Mm -hmm. And that is left to the internal democracy of the party. And I think the debate now is whether it's costlier to have direct primaries or by delegates, which is indirect. And the third one that is allowed under the act that is now being amended is by consensus, where you can all agree that, okay, we are not even going to conduct any activity. We just consider the fact that this person mm. should go and represent us at the general post. 
And of course, it's not the business of INEC to make money available at the primary level. I think the role of INEC as uh, stipulated is, is, is minimal, which is to carry out oversight functions and monitor the activities in a way that we have credible, fair, free and fair primaries. And then for those who believe that they have the popularity with the wards and the grassroots, they may not be afraid of the primary election because when you talk about the primary, all the cardholders in the party can come out to choose who their representative at the election will be. When you talk of indirect, that means some delegates will go and represent them at the convention to choose candidates. And the candidates that are chosen there, that decision becomes binding on the other party. So if you ask me, the direct primaries appear to be more representative of democracy than the indirect. And when we even talk about the cost, it's probably because we are making reference to our society where the processes are so highly monetized. In an environment where you can deploy IT, you may not need to gather in, in, a, in, in, a, in a physical space to carry out direct primaries or indirect primaries. But in a situation where those who come, for instance, may be exposed to corruption, like incentives, giving them money to ensure that they vote for a particular candidate, then you may be talking of cost. And for anyone who wants to venture into politics, you should expect that it's capital intensive. But then credibility, and right the now, credibility of, um, you know, those who are involved in this election, uh, this direct primaries process is what has been called to question because you just mentioned the issue of technology. We're yet to deal with the teething problems that INEC is facing, especially with what we saw in Anambra, the beavers malfunctioning. These things will always happen. But then when we want to develop or push for such technology uh, use during direct primaries, then we need to also look at the credibility of the people who are handling the technical part of it. What's to, who's to say that there's not going to also be some form of inducement um, virtually? You know, within the human cycle, you may never have a perfect presentation, but you upscale, like you brilliantly mentioned now, we have the infrastructural gap to support what is ideal. Whether we like it or not, the economy of the future, the governance system of the future is artificial intelligence driven. And so we need to start from providing electricity, providing the infrastructure that will support effectiveness and efficiency. Mm -hmm. And if that is the direction the government is moving, then you provide the template for those who will operate within the system to key into it. If, for example, now by dividends of governance, we have constant electricity, IT facilities are affordable, people can engage virtually, effectively, then we won't have to be talking about mobilizing millions of people to Abuja because we want to conduct primary elections. So that's what we are saying. So, mm -hmm. And elections are critically tied to governance. When people are elected into offices, they should look at the future and put things in place that we enhance performance, improve our circumstances, and ensure that we catch up with the system in the global uh, arena that are examples of good governance. So for me, uh, it, 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 if we have these challenges, it's because we have made a choice not to progress as a nation. And of course, if it is very important to the nation, we prioritize and ensure that those things are put in place. They are not rocket science. They are not impossibilities. They are possible. Some countries of the world run this system effectively. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, let me come to you, Mr. Chomi. So there are a group of CSOs um, who have disputed this 500 billion claim, just as you have come up with, a, a, you know, an IT aspect or a perspective as to how we can, you know, reduce costing. They're not just asking um, that the federal government, you know, jettison the idea of 500 billion naira cost. They're also questioning why it's taking Mr. President so long to extend to this bill, even after INEC has responded to his message. You know, let, let's put it in perspective. The president has about 30 days to assent the bill or veto it. 
on the transfer to his office by the National Assembly. And I think this was passed to him on the 19th of November, 2021. And it should be expected that he will consult the Attorney General of the Federation, the INEC, the National Assembly, which he has done. And of course, the political parties, because the INEC had to advise the president that, okay, why don't you talk to the direct stakeholders in this, find out what their policies are before you assent to it. And some stakeholders are saying, uh, even without the consultations, go ahead and assent to it. Then if we have issues, we raise it, which may be costlier, because that means we may have to start going through the process again. And it is expected also that as a government, the government should have sat down through the value chain of this amendment to look at the best practice globally and incorporate that into what we are trying to put in place, particularly when this is an attempt to improve on the Electoral Act of year 2010. And if you look at the Act of 2010, it gives permission, like I mentioned, to three uh, approaches mm -hmm. to primaries, the direct primary, the indirect, and the consensus. But this time around, under the amendment, the, the legislatures are only recommending that only direct primaries should be approved for all parties to choose their candidates that will be presented at the general elections. While some are comfortable with this, some are not comfortable. And talking about the cost, I've mentioned earlier, one of the advantages of technology is to help you reduce costs. I recall when the COVID-19 pandemic you know, swept in early 2020, even the Federal Executive Council meetings were held virtually. Mm -hmm. And you can imagine how much it cost the nation to hold these meetings physically. The meetings of presidents of ECOWAS you know, were held uh, virtually. So you can imagine the cost of traveling with the team that we go with the president. So by and large, if we want to make progress, the possibilities are there. So it's now a matter of whether we are dragging our feet or reluctant to catch up with the, uh, the global environment. And like I said earlier, right now, it's all about artificial intelligence. And talking about the infrastructure, you look at places like the UAE, they have the Ministry of Artificial Intelligence. They're already engaging the future economy. So why can't we also do that? But it appears that we are still at the rudimentary level. And when we choose to remain there, we have difficulties. Even implementing the laws, we... I don't know, uh, I don't know if I agree with you that we are at the rudimentary level because, I mean, Nigerians have been in the forefront of coding and all kinds of things in terms of AI and tech. But it is not necessarily we. I'm guessing that this should have been... Is the government ready to embrace this level of artificial intelligence or technology in an electoral system? Remember, some years ago, even um, early this year, the issue of... Um, the e-voting has continuously been debated. It was almost a push and shove for us to even include the idea of electronically um, transmitting results. So really, is it the people that are unable or is it the government that's unwilling? You know, the role of the government is to regulate the society. And so the government should not be seen to be lame in dealing with situations. So if the government wants it done, it can be done. We see these things happening. I mean, the level of security you find around Aso Villa, a date of a section 14 of section 2 of the Nigerian Constitution 1999 has amended that said the security and the welfare of the people shall be the primary purpose of government has any meaning. So on possibilities, these things are possible. And when the government puts this in place, the people don't have any excuse going forward. For example, if this amendment flies through and we stand by the fact that all parties must conduct their primaries through direct approach, then who is going to contend with that? It becomes the law. So whatever the government puts in place, we regulate the activities. And that is why we keep advising that you look out through the window and try to find out how some countries have achieved it. Like I said, for example, in Singapore, Singapore is already considering 
the future of the workplace, you know, what will happen in the future. And they are preparing their people for that encounter. So, and that is what we are saying. And when I made reference to being at the rudimentary level, I believe you understand me. A level where sometimes private personal interests dictate what policymakers will roll out. So if people in progress are more powerful than those who are in favor, we will say, let's go. But where we escalate our governance mindset to the then you go for what is best. As we engage on this uh, topic right now, I you know we have some professional organizations that have been carrying out e-voting for years. I belong to one, and we've been it's been so smooth. Before the day of the AGN, you can cast your votes in your car, in your sitting room, anywhere. These devices will work if we want them to work. Mm. But when you have votes who will not allow them to work, then they will scuttle everything, and it's costly for us. Hundred billion. So here about billions and billions and billions. So the progress is a possibility. And the big question now is, are you ready for the progress? For example, when the COVID-19 came and there was a lockdown, people stayed at home. It wasn't a matter of whether you had an option or not. And it really, as we speak right now, I think the government just gave a directive that civil servants below the level of... Uh, Grade level 12 could return to, to, to office fiscally. Uh, some of them have been operating virtually. So, whoever thought that that system could come in? Right now, we are talking about hybrid uh, HR management. You can work in the physical office, work from home, work from anywhere as long as you are delivering. So, these are possibilities. The world will not remain the same. Mm, interesting. Go and study the Brazilian template, get around the world and see the great things that are happening. I mean, recently an election took place in the UK. Who heard about the rancors and the rancors? So it's about choice. And the government is the biggest stakeholder when it comes to formulating policies and implementing policies. So the direction they take us either to pay off our indebtedness extensively, and we did pay off. So it, it's, it, the government should not be seen to be given excuses. You must deliver and you must right now with the globalization concept you are not alone you look around you see the countries that are making progress around the world then you study what they have done and you put those as part of your policy implementation and you can i mean you can look at rwanda you can look at uh, tanzania you can look at australia sweden you know we will without living in nigeria you can study best practices around the world you can if you even want to do an informal study in Harvard Business School without leaving Lekki in Lagos there. These are possibilities. And that is the power of IT. And that is where I stand, that we can make progress. While I agree with you, while I agree with you and the position that you've taken, uh, it takes me back again to, um, you know, the hiccups, even as we're having this conversation where uh, we're having to hold our breaths to be sure that you can hear us from the other end so I don't know if we're really ripe enough in terms of the technology, the, the bandwidth, if we have the wherewithal. But then again, from this conversation, it looks like that's what the political parties have to deal with and worry about. But going forward, 2022 is just around the corner. We're just a few weeks, if not two, uh, two and a half weeks away from 2022, which is campaign season, which is a campaign year. Now, if we do not get this bill signed into law early enough, um, how do we make sure that 2023 is free, fair, and credible already? We have had, or INEC rather, has had um, opportunities to test, you know, to see if they're up to par with the kind of electronic or e-voting system that we're aspiring to. And we've continuously seen almost the same kind of issues creep up. So really, um, are we probably um, punching above our weight? You know, the elections may go on. Don't forget that this amendment has been on. Before the 2019 election, we expected some amendments to be assented to. They were never assented to, and the elections went on. You see, so, like I said, it's either the president assents to this or you, you veto it. Or whatever the case may be, if that is not done, then the old act 
will be in operation. And that means the status quo of the fact that you can have direct primaries, indirect primaries, or consensus primary, we hold and we go on. And whether our elections will be free, fair, and credible is a big question for what we choose to deploy. And okay. I think we have made a bit of progress in that area. If you look at the recent Anambra State election, by virtue of the governorship election, by virtue of uh, the ways of the federal government and the things that happened, the insecurity, many would have expected that some unnecessary influence would have been wielded. But the people insisted, no, this is the candidate we need. And then all the arms of government came together and the relevant stakeholders came together. So if we can choose to allow the will of the people to prevail, then we may begin to move in the direction of putting in place those we trust to represent our interests. And that, again, is a very strong argument for the proponents of direct primaries. If okay. I am a member of a party, I should be given the direct access to choose those who will go and represent me, and I may now decide not to exercise that, that mandate. So, and this is what we are talking about. Okay. And democracy is the government of the people, by the people and for the people. So if you are going to bat my hair, I should be expected to sit down in that salon. You know, you don't cut my hair in absentia. So, and that's what we are. And when we get to that level, even politicians will begin to ensure that they do what we please the people. And having right. said that, we need to give cognizance to our environment, which is poverty reading, whether it's direct or indirect. There are still possibilities and the temptations of corruption because, you know, some will tell you it's all about stomach infrastructure, it's all about getting what I can get. So that is why at the general level, we must develop this country All right. and bring back prosperity to the people. We have to go. Thank you so much, um, Barista Jide Ologun, for being part of the conversation. Unfortunately, uh, we lost the connection with um, Sh uh, Mr. Shomi. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. God bless Nigeria. All right. Well, thank you all for staying with us. Coming up on Plus Politics, the move of the Lagos for Lagos group to join the PDP in the state is being greeted with criticism. We'll take a short break now.